therapist, uh, what is it? What is it that we we turn to? What what is the ghost ranch going to be like when we return? Um, I will read a few ghost ranch poems uh, from uh, presents. I want to start with a poem published afterwards in a poetry online journal. And I want, I would like you to take, if you can, our sense of exile and homelessness and nostalgia at Ghost Ranch and try to reimagine ourselves there together with recognizing our distance. Poem is called Love Song to the Rocks of Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. In the high desert of Northern New Mexico, on the floor of a tropical inland sea, dinosaurs once called home, red sandstone and shiny rose quartz, mesas and canyons, buttes and spires, speak in the tongue of 200 million years. Monuments to time tower here. Fathomlessness sky crowns the kingdom of stone below. What tough skin these old rocks. Faces weathered and pockmarked. I touch you, you touch me back with your craggy, coarse texture, your ruddy glow in a low sun unmasks your tender countenance. Mute rock cannot conceal your comforting presence. How to wrap my arms around the valley of shining stone. My eyes do no better than my outstretched arms to embrace a place not even mind can hold. You are beyond compass. We're, we're not there. I hope in some little way, this helps make you feel at least in the presence of what you remember, if not allow you to, to maybe almost walk back into it. Um, a, a lot of us have things that we can't call memory, at least I don't, because the experience is like, I don't remember it as a past, I relive it, I'm back there. Uh, I can walk, I can walk into Ghost Ranch through, through poems by other people, through photographs. Part of my dress rehearsal every year, going back, I don't know, 25 or more years, I go online to Google. This is no advertisement, okay? And I, look at as many photographs as I can of every facet of Ghost Ranch I can find to try to put myself into the mood, into the spirit to, to immerse myself. That's Applied Anthropology 101 for my own life. Let me shift to another immersion, a very different one, a terrifying one that we live in the midst of and is part of our lives, if not also part of our bodies. DNA has this double helix, you know, 
consider our toxic double helix, the age of Trump and the age of COVID-19 and what that kind of DNA weaves. I wrote a poem called Walk to the Polling Place, November 2020 US. It's going to be published, I hope, in October in, in a journal, an online journal, where I hope some people will get a chance to look at it before the election. If, in fact, it takes place in November or God knows what's going to take place. Um, please forgive my horrible voice. Um, I wish I were Linda Ronstadt or Luciano Pavarotti. Um, I'm cracked voice a little bit because I'm nervous, even though I'm in the company of people who are family to me in many cases, closer than some people in my own family. Walk to the polling place, November 2020. Aerosol eyes drop let's, of hate and dread, commingle with the coronavirus, infect and kill where they will, no one invulnerable to their stealth. A thick miasma has settled upon this line of hopefuls who were here to do their part in choosing the next tribal chief. No one certain to be alive the day of his inauguration. Some wear face masks. Others renounce protection. Some keep distance from persons in front and behind them. Others crowd flaunt the rules, fear and bravado in common determination to cast a prized vote. So much time to wait and yet too much time for questions to seep into contemplation of the main reason to be here to decide for whom to vote, questions never before asked. Who among us will not be in line for the next election taken by the plague instead? Who could be here now, but is not because of some exclusionary law? Do voting machines record my choices or are they programmed to obey other voices? Were they hacked from across the sea? Does my ballot shape the future? Or is the outcome already determined? Are there secrets no one will reveal? Doubt swells. For what do I stand so long in line and wait? What future do the witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth foretell? Toward what fate do Wagner's norns, norns weave their rope to cast their spell? Or are their auguries owned as well? Mired in a smog of doubt, I still refuse to leave. When at last I arrive in the polling booth, I cast my vote and pretend it matters. Think of the people on the U.S. southern border who have been called drug addicts, racists, 
an invasion. God, if you if you took overhead photographs of this scraggly, barely caravan caravan of hopeful, maybe hopeless, helpless people who are fleeing being murdered. Does this look like an invading force? The poem's called Unclaimed. It's fairly recent. I show up on your doorstep. You decline even to greet me but only say as your index finger points far away, you do not belong. You are not from here. You can never be one of us. I see in her eyes and in her forearms, tightly locked against her chest, that she will never claim me as related to her in any way. Dejected, I turn to leave, but first say to her, looking into her frozen face, I am the stranger you once were, and fear again to be. You were unclaimed and cannot recognize yourself once more in me. A very short poem, <clears throat> syllogism. Okay, let me back up. I am reading you my poems from now, this miasma, political, clinical, smog in Denver from Colorado smoke smog all over the United States from California smoke. I am reading not only Howard Stein, but asking you as you read, when I knock on your door with my poem, do you open your home, your heart, and say, not just, well, that's a good poem. That's a horrible poem. That's an interesting experience you, Howard, had. Or does it also remind me, Kenzie Allen, Joe Garrett, Lucor, Melanie, gee, I've been through that. You're giving me my life back. You're reminding me of my world. Syllogism. Your intimidating words continue to ring in my ears long after you have hurled them. They felt like a beating and my soul still smarts just because you say you don't remember doesn't mean it did not happen. Fugitive hues. Imagine late afternoon, early evening, Ghost Ranch, mesas and canyons. On the mesa's steep face, on the canyon's deep walls, each slight change in the sun's angle 
provokes a new color for which no name can be found. The tone vanishes before it can be fixed in sound. So swiftly do colors arrive and depart. The largest box of children's crayons could not contain sandstone, sandstone's story of daily rhythm in this high desert sun. Futile to try to pin down in words fleeting color, fleeting time, each glance, both a perishing and a renewal. Cottonwood leaves in autumn. Remember on the flat plain where a lot of the housing is, uh, as well as up on the Mesa and lots of other places too. From one side, you, you look across the large grassy, what used to be alfalfa field and this line of cottonwood line a creek. If we're lucky when we're there, leaves have turned blazing yellow. Across the parched hayfield, a stand of old cottonwoods lines the bank of a mostly liquid arroyo come late September. We can hardly wait for the first cold snap when summer's ripe green, ripe green leaves abruptly change to brilliant yellow. Of the many ways of reckoning time, we mark ours by fall's alchemy of wood of cottonwood's color, transmutation of leaves through a shift in the direction of Earth's tilt in its journey around the sun. How odd that when explanation should suffice, we nonetheless welcome this transposition in color as if a loved one had just returned home. Real short poem. Imagine canyons and mesas and mountains arising from this long vista. A long meadow stretches to the far mountains that act as a rim to the Chama Valley. Eons ago, an inland sea dinosaurs called the place home. Today, we tremble at the thought of our own extinction, caused not by an asteroid, but by ourselves. <clears throat> um, I taught physicians for 45, 50 years and a lot of physical and biological anthropologists also talk about the natural history of disease, how it starts, how it proceeds what its outcome is. Coronavirus 2020, or the natural history of disease. This is a 
sort of long poem. So please bear with me. And I'm looking at time. Um, uh, I know we are limiting ourselves to 50 minutes so we can tend to our own biology. Um, if I am not cognizant of my watch, may I ask Joe or someone to, sell, to say, Stein, time to stop. And I also want to stop so that you can reflect now as well as in our workshop at the end of the day. Coronavirus 2020, worldwide pandemic called natural disaster, animal human transfer, perhaps in China, but as old as the agricultural revolution, when people settled in towns and cities, groups large enough for infectious disease to spread like an open prairie grass fire. Natural history disease, like I learned in fifth grade. Who would think we humans are part of nature that shapes the course of nature? Consider Donald J. Trump, presidential oracle of the United States, who like Wagner's Norns, foretells because he is all knowing. Our presidential oracle possesses unprecedented power to know the truth and impose it. So with the coronavirus plague that seemed to begin its dread journey in sick, of sickness and death in Wuhan, China, late 2019, for some two and a half months, our presidential oracle knew better than to heed earlier warnings about the certainty of a pandemic. He wrote off any danger, imminent danger. This virus was just like ordinary flu and would, would quickly pass, he assured us. With the sweep of a pen, he dismissed cadres of public health experts abroad and from his closest counsels here. I'm a businessman, he reminded us. Who needs to pay so many people to sit around doing nothing? Dams everywhere began to burst. Our president oracle, presidential oracle noticed only the trickle. When he at last acknowledged the grave danger, its cause was everyone else his fault. A plot he called by his political foes to defeat him, called the pandemic, the Chinese virus, theirs, as though they inflicted on us. The presidential oracle, the great builder of walls, unwittingly left our door open and let the pestilence in. Who knows how many thousands of people now hundreds of thousands would become gravely ill and die because our presidential oracle believed only in himself. Surely I am more infallible than any science. If the presidential oracle has shaped part of the history of the disease, how entirely natural then is the history of the coronavirus? Sometimes natural history of disease is not entirely natural. The prairie fire is already there. We supply the gasoline and ignition. How am I, somebody help me with time. How am I close to 50, 50 minutes? I hope I have not over exceeded it. Um, I will read one more Ghost Ranch poem and then ask for you all to Just say, wh wh where are you? 
in your lives? And has the poetry given you something in your life that you hadn't thought of before? This is the last poem in my book, Presence. And with my rather long list of medical shit going on in my life, uh, I hope to live to be with you all at Ghost Ranch again. That's where this poem comes from. Immediacy and memory. Juniper and mesquite, deep canyons and sandstone cliffs, the Chama River and Piedra Lumbra Valley, embraced by a forever sky. My companions and kin, as close to me as I am to myself until I must leave for ordinary place, ordinary time, vowing to return but uncertain I can keep my promise. How to turn, how to transform presence into memory, knowing I must leave the badlands behind. Remembering takes over for immediacy and will have to suffice, though it never can soothe the sting of your absence. I had never thought to grieve old rock and dead tree and hard scrabble land. They would grant me new life if only I could return. Where are you? Where's your heart? Where's your soul? Where's Where's Ghost Ranch? Where's your Ghost Ranch? Where's your COVID-19? Where's your life? I think you're allowed to turn your mics on. Am I, am I violating rules? Thank you so much for, you know, always bringing something new and um, thought provoking that uh, that we have come to to cherish as a organization. Um, I know we all appreciate it and and look forward to uh, hopefully many, many more years of uh, uh, of all of your um, fantastic insights. Um, I want to take this opportunity to maybe open up uh, and, and let people, you know, comment or um, talk about what they're experiencing themselves uh, in regards to, to Howard's, uh, Howard's presentation. So if there's anyone that wants to say anything, please, you know, please do so right now. And also uh, anyone who is watching on YouTube, please feel free to ask a question. I am monitoring that chat as well. Thank you for your poems, Howard. Um, it just made me think about how much I also hope that we can all be together at Ghost Ranch again someday, hopefully soon. Um, and I think the juxtaposition of your poems about homelessness and then your poems about home in Ghost Ranch really puts a finger on at least how I've been feeling in all of this. So thank you. You always... Uh, you always find a way to say what, what I'm feeling better than I could, so. Thank you, Melanie. That means a very lot to me. And I, I found in listening to your poem, Unclaimed, that it resonated in kind of maybe a, a lateral way or kind of to the side in reflecting it 
going into familiar spaces around Denver and these spaces being extremely unfamiliar and like people look at each other as frightening strangers because of the pandemic. And it, it's really changed this sense of being home but not being home. Uh, Ariana Rees on YouTube says, you can tell Howard, I don't know where my ghost ranch is, but hopefully I can discover that. Thank you for your poems and your knowledge. Thank you, thank you. I really love this idea too of the um, presidential oracle particularly. It's an odd place to find ourselves in that we keep turning to what we would think would be a source of news or truth. And it's just a sort of odd uh, sort of disconnect that you feel every time, even when you know what to expect from that particular oracle. Um, there's like a, there's a sort of Facebook group slash meme going on about sort of a bingo card that you keep for 2020 and you keep checking off odd things like murder hornets and mm -hmm. the pandemic and everything. And um, it's, it's just a surreal place to be. So I appreciated that sort of idea of it as an oracle. And, and thinking back to oracles being a sense of truth, but you can never always, you can really never trust the oracle even, even in ancient times probably. So it's just an interesting connection there. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That's that's true. God, <laughs> it's too true. You all, I'm so happy to get to see you all. But I also really, really love the idea too. Like, what landscapes did we not expect to grieve? And I think that that's there's a larger sort of application there. Like, it makes me think of what parts of life that I wasn't expecting to grieve that I am and the way that that landscape out there that sort of desert landscape um my dad originally comes from Oregon and he's he's always thinking of you know trees and mountains as his landscapes and I think of rocky dry places as my beloved landscapes so it's there's beauty to be found there for sure thank you thank you could I could I say something? I I know this is your time, but I know could I can I open my mouth or should I keep shut? Open it wide. Go ahead, Howard. I see that Ed Knopp is here. I have dedicated this book to him, to our friendship, to our our long drives from. Albuquerque to Ghost Ranch and back. And he knows the geology, the geography, the history. Uh, like the palm of his hand. And he is as much a part of this book and the poems as I am. And to go even further, so are you and your, your predecessors. You know, love is a very slick and slippery and sloppy word, but I love you all and, and so many of those who came before you. You make me feel safe enough year after year, decade after decade, to go way out on a limb on a whole bunch of subjects, long before poetry. And I've learned to trust to be safe among you. It's not that you agree with everything, but uh, High Plains, is more precious than any gemstone I've ever heard of because of what we and Ghost Ranch 
and Estes Park and other places. But more than anything else, what I write, you're part of. This book, Ghost Ranch, is as much yours and especially Ed's as it is mine. I heard you're far too kind. I understand the love we all feel for one another is a mutual binding force that uh, makes the community that we have as well as the the place that, that we lo love to do community at Ghost Ranch and now on the internet. So very special, very, it's, it's, to me, that's what heart is. The, uh, the kinship that we feel, the family, the brotherhood and sisterhood, the genuine interhuman love. Thank you so much for being our, our guiding force in um, the realization of what we're lucky enough to share with one another. I think yeah, I thank, thank you so much, Howard. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Joe. I, I was gonna say that, uh, you know, Howard, you know, we, we talk about community and, and about what, you know, going to Ghost Ranch and having these shared experiences, you know, uh, what it's meant for so many of us and and I think that there's, you know, a different types of relationships that we've come to discover. Um, I know within my generation, uh, and especially, and I, I think this includes, you know, uh, a lot of the people here with with Mel and Lucor and Michael and Max, we are coming from uh, coming into this community, and and we've been a part of it for a number of years now. But it almost feels like there's a parentage that uh, like a, a spiritual and intellectual parentage that we have uh, become adopted to. When, when we come into this community um, with, with Ed and with you, Howard, and, and Jack Schultz, and, um, and these folks that have been not only our mentors, um, but, uh, but have become our friends and our peers, but I, I honestly do believe that in, in a very real sense, you know, um, you are passing on this generational knowledge, this experience that at some point I can hope that all of us will have and be able to share with the next generation of, of scientists and of uh, researchers and anthropologists and poets and all of the people that um, can benefit from a community such as this. And so, you know, to, uh, to, to you guys, you know, uh, and especially to, uh, Howard and, and Ed and, and all these, uh, uh, folks that have, you know, led us to where we are now in this community. I, I really want to say thank you and, and hope that at some point, we can have the same kind of impact on our students and our community that you have had on us. Um, so I, I just want to say that and, and, and especially for, you know, providing us with the venue uh, of like Ghost Ranch. You know, I, I had heard of Ghost Ranch, but I'd never experienced it until High Plains, until we actually got to go down and, and be in such a, a, an amazing place that normally right now we would be, you know, together doing this. Um, and unfortunately, circumstances are what they are. So, you know, instead we are finding a new venue and hopefully bringing in new people that might not have been able to attend, even if, you know, the pandemic hadn't been uh, a part of our lives. So I really just want to thank you, uh, for, for being uh, not only a friend and a, uh, a patriot of this 
uh, endeavor that we are trying to accomplish in in understanding, uh, but for also being sort of a, a parent to all of us younger kids that uh, uh, that have really come to admire and appreciate uh, everything that you guys are, are are providing for us. So, you know, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, everyone.